Okay guys, we're on to 8.5 where we are writing and graphing exponential growth functions. So they do have decay. I think that's the next one. This is a growth. Um, you are used to doing lines and you know that a line is in the form. We've been doing it over and over again. Y equals MX plus B. So here's a linear function. And it's the change in y over the change in x. The change in y is 3. 3 divided by 1. 3 divided by 1. They're all 3 divided by 1. So 3 is your slope. And the y-intercept is when x is 0. So that's how you write, and you're used to doing that. So now we have an exponential function. It's in the form y equals a b to the power of x. You can see x is an exponent. All right, so A is the y-intercept. So that, instead of being B like this, your y-intercept is here. And B, instead of being your slope, it is the change in y's. Okay? So we're still looking for the same kind of things, but it's going to be different. Exponential is multiplication. It grows at a faster rate. You can see the difference. And the line is you're adding or subtracting the same number. So when you look at the numbers and you see they're going up real fast or they're not consistent, like you're not just adding one, then you can kind of look at the numbers and tell that they're going to be an exponential function. So here I'm going to show you, they have an example of one here. y equals 2 times 3 to the x. The 2 is a... And here they gave us the y-intercept. When x is 0, the y-intercept is 2. And here in this function, 2 is a. So that was easy to see. Then b, which is the change in y. So here, negative 2 plus, uh, to negative 1, you add 1. From negative 1 to 0, you add 1. So all of these, in the x's, you're adding 1. Then in the y's, this might look a little bit harder to see. So if you're not sure when you're doing fractions, look at the number 6 times what gives me 18. 3, 2 times 3 gives me 6, and it's easier to see that. 2 thirds times 3, so if I have 2 thirds and I times 3, I get 2, which I get here. Then 2 ninths times 3, I'm showing you here, 2 ninths times 3. 3 goes into 9, and I get 2 thirds, which I do here. So you always have to check. So now that you can see every single number is being multiplied by 3 to get the next number. So my b is going to be 2 thirds. So that's how they came. Oh, sorry, it's going to be 3, because that's what we're multiplying by. So now you can see where they get the b from. It's 3. So a is the y-intercept, and b is how fast it's multiplying. Okay, so we are going to do a few. So let me find a couple of examples. And we can write this out. So growth functions. So a lot of times I just give you a table. This is x, y. I've got negative 2 and 2. Negative 1 and 4, 0 and 8, 1 and 16, and then let me expand this, 2 and 32. The fact that it's not going at the same rate and it's increasing fairly fast should let you know that it's an exponential function. So there are tip-offs that let you know that you're not dealing with just a line, all right? You don't see the same number. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 2 does not give you 8. So you can tell straight away it's not a line. All right? So we need to write a function. Do we know A already, the y-intercept? And we do. It's 8. So that part's easy. What we have to get is B. So let's look at the change here. Negative 2 to negative 1. We're adding 1. Negative 1 to 0. 1. 0 to 1 is 1, 1 to 2 is 1. So we're adding 1 here. Now here, think, if it's not a linear function, what are we multiplying 
2 times what, and you check before you write, 2 times what gives me 4, 2. 4 times 2 gives me 8. 8 times 2 gives me 16. 16 times 2 gives me 32. It works on all of them. It has to work on all of them. So we are multiplying by 2. We're timesing everything by 2. So that means A or B here is 2. So I go ahead and write it like this, or I leave a gap. You'll see a lot of times um, that what they do is this. So that's a multiplication, not a decimal. Okay. Sometimes when it's a fraction, you'll see they put parentheses around. But this is how you'll see it. So we can look straight away, and we can tell that's a y-intercept, and then that's the change at which it's multiplying. So it's growing. So they use... Um, Exponential growth functions all the time in finances, you see that a lot. Interest and things like that, for you or against you, if you're saving in, in um, some kind of um, bank or anything where you're saving um, for the future, a lot of times um, you get compounded interest. It just doesn't show up very much when you don't have much money, but that's how wealthy people get more and more wealthy because once you have a lot of money, the interest compounded on their money is so much on a daily basis, it just keeps making more and more money. So the wealthy people get wealthier. In the negative, the growth rate can work against you if you put a lot of things on credit cards and you don't pay them off on a monthly basis and you owe, then it works against you. All right. So let's go ahead and look and see maybe some more. Okay, let's graph this. So I'm going to go ahead and use some graphing paper here. Let me hone in a little bit. So we are going to go ahead and graph y equals 2 to the x. And you can tell it's a growth function because it's greater than 1. When we get tomorrow's lesson, I think we're doing decay, and anything less than 1 is decay. So they want us to graph this function and identify its domain and range. So I'm going to give you some points that I kind of use all the time on these. Okay. So I use 0, and I use the set 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 2. So you want to use the same integers, but positive and negatives of each other. And you're going to see a pattern to this. That's why it works so nicely. The first one I'm going to plug in here is 2 to the 0 power. All right, so I'm going to show over here. Anything to the 0 power we learned from exponents is 1. Okay, then I'm going to do the positive ones because they're pretty easy. 2 to the first power, we're plugging it in as an exponent. 2 to the first power is just 2. Then we're going to plug in 2 to the second power. 2 to the second power is 4. So you see how easy that is? So look at this pattern. When I have 1, I get 2. When I've got 2, I've got 4. You're going to see when you get negative 1 and negative 2 where 2 and 4 have a pattern, but it's a reciprocal, and you're going to see this in a minute. So I'm going to plug in 2 to the negative 1. So remember, we can't have a negative exponent, so we flip it, and it becomes 1 half. So do you see that negative 1 is 1 half, and 1 is 2? So if this is 4, then I would surely think negative 2 is going to be 1 quarter. But let's go ahead and uh, put that in, write it up here, 2 to the negative 4, so we want to go, sorry, 2 to the negative 2, I'm already thinking the answer in my brain, 2 to the negative 2, we're going to flip it 1 over 2 to the positive 2, because remember that's a rule when you have negative exponents, and 2 to the second power is 4, so this becomes 1 fourth. So using the same numbers gives you a pattern, and it makes it actually very easy. So 0, 1 is right here. That's a y-intercept, so that would be your a, 1. And then at 1, 
over 1 we go up 2, over 2 we go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and at negative 1 we go to about a half, so just kind of there, and at negative 2 we go to a quarter. So we skim here and we go up really fast. So as the numbers get smaller, if I had negative 3, I'd have 1 ninth. So what's going to happen is, as you go along here, this is just going to skim right next to 0, but it's never going to touch it. It's going to skim along close to 0 and never touch it. We call this an asymptote. It's actually written like that. They pronounce it an asymptote. In math, that's a line that skims. It's, it's almost like, think about if you're walking with socks on the floor. Um, the sock gets you really, really close to the floor, but it doesn't quite touch it. That's the way you can think about asymptote. It's really, you're gliding along the floor, but you're not quite touching it. That little piece of sock keeps you from touching it with your foot. So that's the way that you have to think about it. So now we're going to graph um, two of them are positive and negative and see how they go in different directions. So they used y equals 3 times 2 to the x and then y equals negative 3 times 2 to the x. So I'm going to do this one first and then I'm going to plot these points here. So I'm going to use my same points, 0, 1, and 2, negative 1, and negative 2. And on this one, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to use the same points, 0, 1, and 2, negative 1, and negative 2. Okay? So now I'm going to plug in for 0. So 2 to the 0 power. So let me show down here. We start with 0. Anything to the 0 power is just 1. 1 times 3 is going to be 3. Because there is a number in front of 0. So remember I showed you that in the previous. When you're adding zeros or you have 5x to the 0, it would really be 5. Because x to the 0 is 1 and you multiply it by 5. Then here I'm gonna, I've got 3 times 2 to the first power. 2 to the first power is just 2. 2 times 3 is 6. Then I'm going to say 3 times 2 to the second power. 2 to the second power is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So you can see it increases real fast. Alright. Negative 1. We're going to 3 times 2 to the negative 1. So we're going to flip that to the bottom, and 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half. It becomes 3 times 1 half, and 3 times 1 half is 3 and a half. Now we're going to do negative 2. 3 times 2 to the negative 2. Well, we know if we flip that, it becomes 1 over 2 to the positive 2, which is going to be 3 times 1 quarter. What's 3 times 1 quarter? Well, it just becomes 3 quarters. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph that. And the good thing is you have the video, so you can always go back and look at it if you need to see how I did it again. So 0, 3, 1, 2, 3. And we can see it should be crossing the y-intercept at 0, 3. So they match here. Then at 1 we go to 6, 3, 4, 5, 6, at 2 we go to 12, that's 10, 12, so you can see it increases, I'm just putting it above, just kind of winging it, negative 1 and 1 and a half, there's, you can see, and then at negative 2 we go to 3 quarters, which is right here, so you're going to see again, this is going to go and it's going to ride really close. And I'd forgotten in the other one to show the domain and range. Okay, so I'm going to do it on this one. Domain is the x values. So going along here, and this, even though it's going up like that, it's going to continue to go 
along this way forever and ever. So in the x direction, you're going to see that the domain goes from negative infinity to infinity. So you can see that the um, domain includes all real numbers. So I'm trying to look and see how they write it so it'll match your homework real quick. Okay, so domain, you're either going to see it like this from negative, I can see it in the book, negative infinity to infinity, or domain could be all real numbers. Okay, because it includes every number. All right, from this side to this side. Now the range, that's different. The range is the up and down. So this only goes to just above zero and goes all the way up here. So the range, another way of saying it, is all positive numbers. It doesn't include any negative numbers. Do you see that? It does not go down to negative. It does not go past zero. So the range is from here and up. So it's going up this way forever. So another way, like I said, an easy way to say it is the range is all positive numbers. It's not all real numbers. All real numbers means that any number from negative to positive. So the domain is not restricted. From left to right, it can go anywhere. But up and down, it can't go past here. So the range it just includes all positive numbers. All right, so we've graphed this. Now we're going to go ahead and plot the points for this. So let me do it on this so I can show every step and then we can transfer it to the graph. When I put it straight on the graph, sometimes it's a little bit um, condensed and you can't see it um, really well. So here's my T chart. Let me show how I plug in the numbers. So again, I'm going to use the same numbers, 0, 1, 2 negative 1, negative 2, but here I can show, so I like to start with 0, you can start with whatever you want, times 2 to the 0. So anything to the 0 power, is that not just 1? So this thing becomes 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, and so we should get that because they're the same, that's the y-intercept, it should be the same. When x is 0, you get your y-intercept. Let's start with the positives, negative 3, times 2 to the first power. So that's 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. So it looks similar to the other one where we had 1 and 6. Okay, so negative 3 times 2 to the second power, that's going to be 4. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. So when I bring back the other graph, you're going to see they're the same numbers. And I'm just going to show you real quick here. We had 0, 3, 1, and 6, 2, and 12. We just have the negatives because we have a negative in front. All right, so let me go ahead and erase that and work with negative 1 and negative 2 because they are exponents. So minus 3 times 2 to the negative 1. So 2 to the negative 1, that's going to flip because <coughs> that's how we get rid of negative exponents, it becomes negative 3 times a half, which is negative 3 over 2, negative 3 and a half. Then we're going to do negative 3 times 2 to the negative 2. That becomes negative 3 times 1 and 2 to the positive 2. Okay, And this just becomes negative 3 times 1 fourth. Negative 3 times 1 fourth isn't that negative 3 fourths. So look at these numbers. And I'm going to transfer them on this real quick while you're looking how I did that. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and you're going to see how the numbers match from here. 
0, 3 I showed you. We got 0, negative 3. Putting this negative, that's what happened. 1, we got 6. At 1, we get negative 6. So the same numbers, but the negative of them. Same here. Here we had negative 2 and 3 quarters. Here we have negative 2 and negative 3 quarters. So I'm going to graph this in a different um, color. Maybe do it in green. So 0, negative 3. 1, 2. This is right where it crosses this intercept. At negative 1, I go down negative 1 and a half. So negative 1 and a half right here. At negative 2, I go down negative 3 quarters, negative 2, negative 3 quarters. So you can see how this is going. It's like symmetrical around the x-axis here. 1, negative 6, and then 2 goes down to negative 12. So do you see the pattern of this one? Mm-hmm. It's just going the opposite way. But it's still doing the asymptote here. It will not touch zero. But the domain and range are going to be different for this one. Okay? The domain for the green one is the same. All real numbers. All the numbers are included along the x from left to right. So domain is a big R meaning all real numbers. But the range is different now. The range before was all the positive numbers. Do you see that? But the range on the green line, the negative, is going to be all the negative numbers. It doesn't allow it to go um, into the positive. So all negative numbers. So that's a way to write it. And when you're on the test, you write it. If you write it a little differently, but I know what you're saying, then you're going to get uh, full credit, okay? Because on the test, everything's written out in paper, pencil. So whether you write it like this or you describe it in a different manner, but, I, but you're saying it correctly, then that's great. All right, and domain and range takes a little bit of practicing, okay? So you're just going to have to graph these and get used to that. Right, we are looking at finishing up here with a um, problem, a word problem, dealing with exponential growth. So here is the equation for a word problem. Y equals A times 1 plus R raised to the T. Okay, so R, and you want to do that, is the growth rate, how fast something is growing. T is time, the time period that you've invested money or whatever the problem is attaining to. A is the initial amount. Remember the y-intercept is, is the initial amount. So A is the initial amount, however much you borrow or whatever it is, initial amount. And one plus R, so one plus the growth rate is what we call the growth factor. So be careful because they're two separate things, but kind of together. R is just the growth rate. It can be 2%, 6%, half a percent, but one plus R. It's called the growth factor, the whole thing in the parentheses. Okay? So we are going to look at a multi-step word problem here. And I'm just going to go ahead and put it up because it makes it easier to work from here. So it says, let me hone in a little bit. The owner of a 1953 Hudson Hornet convertible sold the car at an auction. The owner bought it in 1984 when its value was $11,000. Obviously, that's going to be important. Let me try to find my pen, underline it, because that's going to be the initial amount. I can see that already. The value of the car increased at a rate of 6.9% per year. So there's your rate right there. So 
The owner of a 1953 sold the car at an auction. He only bought it in 1984. Okay, so that's going to be important the year it was bought. Okay, write a function that models the value of the car over time. All right, so instead of using Y, I'm going to use C for car. So I'm going to write down everything that is important. We know the rate is 6.9%. We know the initial amount A is $11,000. And we know that 1984 is when he first got the car. So one thing about percent, when you deal with a word problem, you have to change it to a decimal. That means dividing by 100. So you move it back two places. So the rate is going to become, let me see. Okay, so if it's here, I move it back one, two places. You always do that. You divide by two and change it from a percent. Percent is, you take a number and multiply by 100, you get a percent. You change it to a decimal, you divide by 100. So I'm just doing that to remind you. All right, so we're going to look and we're going to follow the formula. Instead of Y, we're going to say C. C equals A, 1 plus R times t. So they want us to write a function that models need to hone out so we can see more of this. Okay, so that is going to be the function that we use. But instead of y, we can use c for call. All right, so what is our a? That's all they're asking us to do. So we're going to say 11,000. 1 plus, we're going to change it to a decimal. So 0 0.069, and the time period is just, we don't know, we're just going to put T up there for right now. You do combine this, 1 plus 0 0.069, so the final function is this, 1.069 times T. So that answers the A part, okay? You have to have a function, and they have to give you enough information that you can write one. So you took everything and you plugged it in. So there you answered. You've given a function. Now there's normally a B part, because once you write a function, then they're going to ask you something. Okay, so here it goes. The auction took place in 2004. Okay, so from 1984 to 2004, that's 20 years. All right. Um, what was the approximate value of the car at the time of the auction? Round your answer to the nearest dollar. So all you're going to do, where time is, you're going to plug in 20, because 20 years has passed. So C equals 11,000, your initial amount, times 1.069, which is my entire growth factor here, 20. And you're going to put that in your calculator, and in class I'll show you how to do that. And it should make sense to you. So there's certain things. If you're starting with 11,000, and it's 20 years later, your money should have grown. So you shouldn't end up with negative. You shouldn't end up with anything less than 11,000. And it should be quite a little bit more because it's been 20 years. So remember, math makes sense, you know. Um, you've got to see if your answer is reasonable. 11,000 dollars isn't going to make a million dollars in 20 years. So if you get an answer that's too big, that um, doesn't make sense, then you reject it. If you get a negative answer, something's not right. So after all those years at the auction, we got 41.778. So that was the value of the car 21, 20 years later. Okay, and that makes sense, okay? That's reasonable. 41, it's not a decimal, sorry. Uh, little comma. So 41,778 after 20 years. So it's one of those collectibles that people like to pay to have. Okay. And the very last one that I'm going to show is another 
well, word problem. So let's go ahead and look at it. This is the kind of thing that they might give you on a test. And let's read it and then we'll look at the choices. You put $250 in a savings account that earns 4% annual interest, compounded yearly. So that's what I was talking about when your interest compounds. If it compounds daily or weekly or however they do it, they do it sometimes uh, monthly or quarterly, the more it can compound, the more money you can make. And the more that you have, to put in the more it makes so somebody who's maybe got fifty thousand dollars it yes it makes some money and you want that to happen but someone who's you know a billionaire think about if it's compounding every month how much money that makes or every day so the more money you have to start with the more interest you're going to get so reading on you do not make any deposits or withdrawals so you take nothing out of it and you add nothing to this money how much will your investment be worth in five years so you got 250 dollars so it's five years so you look at these options and some of them kind of common sense so you look and it's like um, a is 300 b is 304 dollars and 16 cents this is 1344 point what is that 56 and then this is 781 so this is like looks really high you know after five years you only have 250 dollars so someone make a ton of money so it's got to be somewhere around here that is too much and 781 dollars is too much for five years okay but you're going to go ahead and you're going to plug it in and I'll show you how they did it. Let's just follow. So they use the same thing. So the initial amount was $250. The growth rate or the rate was 4%. But remember you change 4% to a decimal. So 4% go back two places, 0 0.04. Okay. So 1 plus point zero four and then raise it to five years because here they tell us the time then so this is your growth rate four percent then one plus zero point zero four is your growth factor so one point zero four one and four one hundredths is how you would say it that is your growth factor Stick it in the calculator and there you go, $304.16. So it was B, that's a correct choice. Okay, I know it was a kind of long lesson, but it is something that you haven't really seen before. So we're just gonna practice, okay? And we will continue with the next one. God bless.